Thank you very much, Senator Cruz. I can promise you that big ideas uh, come from Texas. I know our next speaker is going to, for those of you who are leaving, if you could try to do so quietly, I think that this next subject is, is one of the most critical that we're going to address today. Um, so please try to, to keep the noise down. All Americans know we must ensure a roof is over the head of all of our citizens. Yet since the 1930s, the federal government has actively distorted housing markets, particularly through the operation of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the Federal Housing Administration. Currently, taxpayers are responsible for more than $4 trillion in Fannie and Freddie's mortgages and mortgage-backed securities. Yet despite the heavy involvement of the federal government, home ownership rates have barely risen over the last decades. In 1968, the U.S. home ownership rate stood at 63.9 percent. The most recent data have it at 65 percent. Heritage strongly believes Congress should wind down Fannie and Freddie in the next five years by repealing the firm's federal charters. Both entities distort the market by issuing mortgage-backed securities with subsidized government guarantees that the mortgages will be repaid. Now, over the last 10 years, nobody has been a better friend of the American people in Congress than Congressman Jeb Henselin. We live in a time where millions of Americans feel unheard in Washington, D.C. 33,000 lobbyists conspire to make Washington, D.C the city where bold ideas go to die. Those can afford to hire a team of lobbyists, get taken care of on Capitol Hill with tax loopholes, regular relief, and special spending projects. Jeb Henschling has fought for all Americans during his career in Congress, and as chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, has worked tirelessly to promote bold policies. Jeb's committee has jurisdiction over both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and I look forward to hearing his remarks on the protecting taxpayer and Homeowners Act, the PATH Act. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Congressman Jeb Henschling. Mike, thanks for the um, kind introduction, but I must admit, um, I'm sitting here following Senator Ted Cruz to something called a conservative policy forum. Who did I upset at Heritage Action? <laughs> and I was hoping that the uh, senator wasn't having a flashback and thinking this was the Senate floor and was going to speak for a full 21 hours. <laughs> and I'm glad there's still three of you left in the room to hear me. One, I want to thank first the Heritage Foundation for preserving what we all know President Reagan called the last best hope of man on earth. And it's not just enough to celebrate our heritage of freedom and opportunity. We have to act on that heritage, and thus was born Heritage Action. Uh, and I want to thank them uh, for their good work on helping be at the uh, tip of the spear to keep our valuable American exceptionalism alive. Now, uh, personally, I've been speaking about housing finance for quite some time in my congressional career. And it's recently been a hot topic in Washington. What I did not know is that all of a sudden it has gone global. Now, just in case you missed this little news item, just the other day, I read that based upon our success in the United States, Nigeria is now setting up its own version of Fannie Mae. I'm, I'm not making this up. Um, doesn't Nigeria have enough problems already? Um, I want you to know I'm not an investment advisor. Uh, but personally, if I get one of these strange emails from somebody in Nigeria wanting to bring me in on a great real estate deal backed up by their Fannie Mae, I'm personally going to pass it up. Maybe it's just me. You can do what you want. Uh, I'm going to take a pass. Um, I have been concerned about housing finance reform, not simply because I am a policy wonk about housing. It's because I care passionately about freedom and opportunity, as do most of you in this room. And the simple truth is America cannot have a healthy economy unless we have both a healthy and sustainable housing finance system. Regrettably, that is not where we find ourselves today in America. 
We do not have a healthy and sustainable housing finance system because we lack both freedom and opportunity. So where are we today in America? Today, hardworking taxpayers have been forced to engage in the mother of all taxpayer bailouts, nearly $200 billion to bail out Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. That is unconscionable. Today, taxpayers remain on the hook for more than $5 trillion, trillion with a T, in mortgage guarantees, roughly one-third the size of our entire economy, weighing in at roughly $42,000 per American household. Ladies and gentlemen, that is unfathomable. And today, because of the Dodd-Frank Act, think of the Obamacare for credit markets, Washington elites decide who can qualify for a mortgage and who cannot. That is unfair. Changing this unsustainable, unconscionable, and unfair system is why the House Financial Services Committee that I have the privilege of chairing has recently approved the Protecting American Taxpayers and Homeowners Act known as the PATH Act. Instead of a system dominated by government control of the housing finance market, the PATH Act offers an alternative vision, one where housing finance system principally relies upon private capital and market discipline. The PATH Act includes four fundamental goals essential to development of any free competitive market. First, it clearly defines and limits the role of the state. Second, it removes artificial barriers to private capital in order to attract investment and encourage innovation. Third, it provides market participants with clear, transparent, and enforceable rules. And fourth, it empowers consumers with more options, with more informed choices, so that they, not Washington bureaucrats, can decide which mortgage products best meet their needs. It begins by ending once and for all the failed reign of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the government-sponsored enterprises that were at the epicenter of the financial crisis. The PATH Act phases out both of these failed taxpayer-backed corporations over a period to five to seven years. Additionally, it will repeal their misguided affordable housing goals. We all know that affordable housing is not spelled G-S-E. It is spelled J-O-B, and regrettably, jobs are in short supply under this administration. Now, much has been said by the critics of the PATH Act about the so-called need to have Fannie or Freddie or their equivalent in our housing finance system. We should begin by knowing that the U.S. is practically alone in the entire modern industrialized world in having government-sponsored enterprises directly guarantee mortgage securities. The U.S. is also practically alone in the level of direct government subsidy and intervention into our housing market. And guess what? We were also practically alone in the level of turmoil in our housing markets as measured by foreclosures and delinquencies. Ladies and gentlemen, I posit to you there is clearly a direct causal link. By almost any measure, Fannie and Freddie have not propelled the United States to housing finance nirvana. Again, when compared to other modern industrialized nations, whether we look at rates of home ownership or whether we look at spreads between mortgage interest rates and sovereign debt, the U.S. can usually be found somewhere around the middle or the bottom of the pack. Again, regrettably, there is one unfortunate category where the United States is clearly led, and you guessed it, that is foreclosure rates. Only in America can you find a government that subsidizes more so that we, the people, get less. But we do not have to look overseas to see a well-functioning housing market without government-sponsored enterprises. Indeed, we don't have to look any further than our own jumbo market that has successfully operated without them. Prior to the housing bust, the jumbo market was approximately 20% of the total housing market. And in that market, we found capital. In that market, we found liquidity. We found competition. We found the 30-year fixed mortgage. We found consumer choice. We found innovation all right here in America. And all of that was delivered for about 25 basis points, or just one quarter of 1% interest differential from what was provided by the government-sponsored enterprises. I would say a modest amount in order to avoid taxpayer bailouts, government control, and economic 
catastrophe. And by the way, whatever modest interest rate buy-down the GSEs delivered to home buyers, it was clearly offset by some extent by artificially driving up the cost of housing, helping inflate a housing bubble. So in other words, it is not self-evident that the GSEs ever made the home buyer any better off. Now, I've heard that there are arguments for preserving the GSEs, and those arguments are that they are standard bearers through their underwriting purchase requirements, that they serve as loan aggregators for small lenders by purchasing loans through their cash window, and that they provide a conduit for smaller originators to access mortgage investors through the issuance of mortgage-backed securities. And I do believe that these are functions that are indeed helpful to our marketplace. Thus, the PATH Act ushers in a new system of private housing finance that separates out these functions, providing clear and transparent disclosure of mortgage data, giving certainty to contracts and their enforceability, and creating an open-end access utility for mortgage-backed security issuance that is decoupled from the holding of long-term mortgage risk. The PATH Act also reforms the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, because you will not have true housing reform without it. Otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, you're simply pushing in on one end of the failed balloon only to have it bulge out on the other. With the PATH Act, the FHA will finally have a clear, defined, and limited mission, the one that people traditionally associate with the Federal Housing Administration, and that is helping first-time and low- to moderate-income families while also preserving a counter-cyclical role. The PATH Act, import importantly, takes the FHA out of HUD and sets it up as its own autonomous standalone agency uh, with the tools and flexibility it needs to fulfill its mission in a financially sound, less politicized manner. Now more than ever, these reforms of the Federal Housing Administration are critical. Just last September, the FHA became the latest recipient of a taxpayer-funded bailout, the first in the FHA's 79-year history, and I believe without the PATH Act, unfortunately, I doubt it will be FHA's last. It's a bailout that adds $1.7 billion to our national debt, which I agree with our former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, is the single greatest existential threat facing our nation today. If any of you have ever attended or watched proceedings of the House Financial Services Committee, of which I chair, you will see us run in real time a continuous display of the national debt clock. It serves as a constant and sobering reminder of the threat. It is something that must loom large over every issue that we debate in the committee room and indeed on Capitol Hill. Our national debt under President Obama is unsustainable, unconscionable, and I believe immoral, and it must come to an end. Not only will a bankrupt FHA help no one, a bankrupt America will help no one either. The PATH Act will help put the FHA on the right financial footing so it can fulfill its mission safely and soundly. Now, some critics of the PATH Act have called ending the GSE bailout putting private capital in the center of housing finance and right-sizing FHA as, quote-unquote, ideological. I believe what is ideological is being wedded to a status quo which condemns the American people to a never-ending cycle of boom, bust, and bailout. Now, some have asked how the PATH Act will impact the 30-year fixed-rate mortgage uh, that has been the traditional mortgage relied upon by so many. Well, I will tell you, it will continue to exist. The PATH Act will not change that. In fact, the PATH Act, I believe, is the only housing bill before Congress that specifically protects the 30-year fixed rate mortgage bills. Mortgage, other bills do not even mention it. The PATH Act is designed to keep mortgage rates low on non-government 30-year fixed rate mortgages through the creation of a new common securitization utility. This will help level the playing field between big in small financial institutions and help protect consumers by giving them more choices. And I should note that although the PATH Act will preserve the 30-year fixed mortgage, importantly, it will not steer people into the 30-year fixed mortgage. It may be the right product for some, 
but it is not necessarily the right product for all. The real threat to homeowners and financial institutions alike, again, is the Dodd-Frank Act. Don't take my word for it, Moody's chief economist Mark Zandi, perhaps one of the most quoted economists of the left, has testified that Dodd-Frank has written could increase mortgage interest rates one to four percentage points. And CoreLogic reports that half, half of the mortgage loans made just last year would not comply with the Dodd-Frank rules that went into effect just last month. In short, Dodd-Frank Act could cut the number of mortgages in America in half and double the cost of those that remain. And that's why the PATH Act will reverse many of the most harmful regulatory burdens of the Dodd-Frank Act that has been imposed upon consumers and businesses alike. Let me conclude with these thoughts. As our nation charts a path forward on housing reform, many will maintain that we are having a debate between house and no house. I disagree with that framing. I think the real choice is whether or not our generation is going to perpetuate a system that demands more house for us so that our children, in turn, receive less house tomorrow. If so, what an unjust inheritance we leave the next generation. And that's why this debate matters so much. Because when it comes down to it, this really isn't a debate between whether or not we afford the granite countertops or the tile countertops. It's not really a debate about basis points or fixed term loans. And in many respects, it even transcends the issue of housing finance itself. Ladies and gentlemen, it is about freedom. It is about opportunity. It is about sustainability. It is about keeping faith with our founding fathers and our forefathers so that we leave our children in America where they are bound only by the size of their dreams. And we protect that portion of the American dream for those who work hard and play by the rules and want to have a home that they can actually afford to keep. I thank you, and I thank Heritage Action for the opportunity to talk about the PATH Act today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And while you take a seat at the panel, just to quickly introduce the bios are in your packets. Uh, our two panel members, Dr. Norbert Michelle, who is the Research Fellow in Financial Services here at the Heritage Foundation, and Mark Calabria, Director of Financial Regulation Studies. Um, at the Cato Institute, and maybe Norbert, if I can start with you. Um, a year ago, the Heritage Foundation, our Center for Data Analysis, spent um, significant time, came out with four studies looking at the macroeconomic impacts of shutting down these GSEs. Can you talk about that and, and what this would do to the economy and, and housing markets? Sure. Um, so we've actually just relaunched one of those papers at the backgrounder that's available outside, I believe, or online at heritage.org. Um, but basically what, what you see is that the interest rate subsidy, which has been going mostly to the GSEs and not to individuals who buy homes or buy mortgages, uh, is, is rather small. And if we get rid of it, we get a predicted a, a relatively small impact on the economy in general. And, and actually, uh, we're actually predicting a, a, a lower cost of home ownership. We have less debt, which is in many cases a good thing a slightly lower monthly down payment, um, a sl a slightly lower home prices in response to the interest rate. And incidentally, I think that's probably one of the reasons that the realtors are so adamant against these sorts of reforms, because they don't want housing prices to drop. Um, that's, that's the quick version. Of course, there's more in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have it outside. Mark, can you talk, uh, going forward, the CFPB is suggesting that lenders look to government entities, such as the Federal Housing Administration, for guidance on underwriting criteria. Does this approach address the problems that, that contributed to the financial crisis? It actually reinforces, you know, some of the problems that led us to the financial crisis. And, you know, let me make a, emphasize a bigger point. Uh, when we talk about Fannie Freddie, when we talk about FHA, we're not talking about subsidies for home ownership. We're talking about subsidies for home debt. You know, and there's a very big difference. Uh, I find it uh, amazing that before 1960, the majority of homeowners owned their homes free and clear. 
thought about it, think about that. It was actually your house, not the bank's house, not Fannie Mae's house, not somebody else's, but yours. Of course, unless the local government wanted to take it away from you, which is a whole other, other problem. Um, but that, that said, um, one of the problems before the crisis was we, the government really put its thumb on the scales in a very big way that drove mortgages to the government. And you're seeing this reinforced by Dodd-Frank and most particularly uh, the CFPB rules that exempts Fannie and Freddie and FHA. Uh, and it really, and this also has to do with the QRM, the Qualified Residential Mortgage Retention Rules, which are slightly different than the QRM rules. But all of these rules come together and really do push the incentive uh, for servicers to sell, lenders to sell their mortgages to the government rather than retain it themselves. Uh, and at the end of the day, part of the problem is that um, we've set up a system where it's very difficult to deny, uh, to deny loans. It's also very difficult to foreclose loans. And it's also very difficult to charge to cover that risk. And that the only way someone's really going to take that is if the taxpayer is ultimately on the hook. So I would emphasize, uh, I think we need to start with Fannie and Freddie and FHA. But you know, our entire system of uh, finance from CFPB to the Basel Capital Standards, all of these things come together and distort our mortgage finance system in a way that we need to address. Mr. Chairman, help us understand coming out of today what we can do to, to help you on this. You, it wasn't just plain problems for Senator Cruz that caused the schedule to be this way. We wanted you to have the, the <laughs> people in the audience with iron bladders and, and commitment to the cause. What, what can we do going forward? Fannie and Freddie have been around for quite some time. Uh, Fannie dating back to um, the New Deal. Uh, Freddie, I think, coming about in 1970. Uh, People who have um, built a system, uh, our careers based upon government guarantees are loath to give them up. Uh, so the lobbying has been quite strong. Uh, and if you believe that ultimately to have a sustainable system of home ownership, uh, to end the system of boom, bust, and bailout, that we need to transition uh, to a competitive marketplace, you have to have your voice be heard. Um, I have uh, been a member of the House Financial Services Committee for 11 years, and I would say uh, those who have attempted to protect Fannie and Freddie and the status quo um, have presented the strongest lobbying that I have seen in the jurisdiction of that committee, and they're not letting up. And uh, nature abhors a vacuum. Politics abhors a vacuum. Um, so all I can say is to uh, exercise your constitutional right um, to uh, uh, have your grievances redressed and let your voices be heard. Uh, but they need to be heard soon. I, I am fearful that the window, the opportunity to address this, uh, at least in this Congress, um, may begin to fade. I need not tell you it's always challenging to get anything done in divided government. Uh, and I think history will show us that the closer we get to an election day, uh, it gets even more challenging. Um, there is not too many things I agree with the Obama administration on, uh, but we all know the old adage about a uh, stop clock at least being right twice a day. Um, they are actually right to, in wanting to end Fannie and Freddie. So there is an opportunity here, I think. Um, but if this doesn't get done, my guess is in the next um, several months, uh, the window will probably pass. And unfortunately, more debt. Um, every day that Fannie and Freddie remain is a day they get stronger. Let's, uh, let's go to the audience for questions. Anybody, congressman for the panel? question for the panel or the congressman? Yes, sir, in the middle. What, what's, Obama's, uh, what, what's Obama's incentive to, uh, to, to end uh, Fannie and Freddie? You're asking me to psychoanalyze the press? <laughs> <laughs> um, I may be a little um, uncertain here. Um, what is his? Uh, listen, it's a, it's a very valid question. You always want to know what uh, is motivating one to do this. And again, I, I do have some trepidation in that. What I do not want to see is um, a ruse or a guise to where Fannie and Freddie are 
essentially put into the Federal Witness Protection Program, given a new name in cosmetic surgery and unleashed on an unsuspecting public. Um, so I assure you that whatever President Obama will sign into law is not going to be identical to the PATH Act. Um, but right now I'm having a tough time envisioning a system that is worse than the one we have, although I'm sure this administration is quite capable of it. <laughs> Norbert and Mark, maybe you guys do this professionally. This is what you do for a living. You have a chairman who is leading in a big, bold way on issues. Can you put this in a, a historical context? How big is this, um, what Chairman Hensling's proposing to do? Uh, well, let me let me start out with, with a bigger, you know, a picture as broad as I can go on this, which is... You know, to me, Fannie and Freddie were, I think, undeniably part of the financial crisis. They weren't the only cause. There were a lot of other causes, but they were a big part of this. And if we had not had this financial crisis, I don't think we would have had Obamacare. I don't think we would have had this expansion of government we've seen. You know, the chairman mentioned Fannie Mae coming in the New Deal. The New Deal came after the Great Depression. And so the point I want to emphasize is when we have big financial crises, it provides cover for the expansion of government. And if we don't fix the current system, it's going to destroy our mortgage market, it's going to destroy our economy, but it's also going to provide the environment for the next big expansion of government. So if we ever really do want to tame these financial cycles, um, Fannie and Freddie is the place to start. It's not the place to end, but it's certainly the place to start. And it's a task that is Herculean, to say the least. Uh, there, we have to remember that there was actually a 1934 act that gave us Fannie Mae, but that act didn't even authorize the creation of a federal agency, much less the ability to go and buy non-governmental insured mortgages. Um, after World War II, continuously after World War II, uh, different, different presidential administrations have tried to privatize, fully privatize the GSC, oh, well, Fannie Mae and then both GSEs. Um, and it, we, we basically haven't been able to eradicate this problem since it started. You know, let me, let me, let me say another point. It's very easy if you're just a casual observer to think, well, here are two companies, you know, what's the big deal? So let me first start and put in context. If you add all of the debt together that Fannie and Freddie have issued, it is greater than the entire market capitalization of all 3,000 companies on the NASDAQ. I mean, these aren't just two random little companies. These are two companies that dominate uh, our tr our uh, debt is what about 16 trillion now. Um, Fannie and Freddie's debt is about six trillion. Um, it's quite comparable to the size of the national debt. So you simply can't, in my opinion, care about the deficit and not care about Fannie and Freddie. Um, they are also a big foundation in the in, in the bad way in our financial system. Uh, banks are full of Fannie and Freddie debt. The repo markets are full of Fannie and Freddie debt. There really are, you know, and I challenge my friends on the left, if you care about too big to fail and you want to end too big to fail, it has to start with Fannie and Freddie. There, there is nobody who is more too big to fail than these institutions. One, one, real quick. Uh, one of my colleagues joked that in 2008, he thought to himself, well, we have these two insolvent companies. They're worthless. We just have to get rid of them. How hard can that be? <laughs> and here we are five years later, and virtually nothing has changed. So it's, just, it's not easy to get this fixed. Yes, the answer is it's hard. <laughs> Diane. Hi, with the arrival of Mr. Watt, um, what do you think that tells us about the, um, you know, the administration's real position on, on housing reform, and what should we expect coming out of him? I'm supposed to be meeting with uh, my former colleague soon. Uh, I'm looking to my trusty staff. I think he has reached out. Um, listen, I have a lot of respect for Mel Watt. We have not seen eye to eye on many um, issues. Um, I'm hoping that uh, perhaps from a different perspective than the top row on the Democratic side of the House Financial Services Committee, um, maybe there will be an epiphany about issues. Um, I don't know that to be true. Uh, I will comment less on my former colleague and perhaps comment more on his predecessor, and that is uh, rarely will you find a more astute, finer uh, public servant than Ed DeMarco, uh, who, is, who did incredible work. And um, 
So without saying anything about Mel Watt, I think it speaks volumes about the administration and um, replacing Ed DeMarco, who was really, and, and a lot of the PATH Act, frankly, is codifying into law a lot of the groundbreaking work that he has done as head of the FHFA. Um, so that will be the polite and adroit way I avoid your question. <laughs> Well, we're taking another question. I, I, I do want to echo that. Uh, I spend somebody who spends a lot of time criticizing government, but Ed DeMarco is a real public servant who does deserve a lot of applause. Maybe over here on the right in the pink shirt. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, you've done a great job of standing in the uh, flood insurance reform reform uh, debate for something other than political expediency. Uh, so I just want to ask, is that... Um, can you talk about a little bit about the interplay maybe between the housing requirements and the flood insurance program? And maybe if you've learned anything from that uh, debate about how to get the PATH Act over the finish line? I think Johnny Manziel will go high in the NFL draft. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, flood. Clearly a number of... Um, of uh, my colleagues have legitimate concerns about the uh, pace uh, of reform, sticker shock for a number of their constituents. Um, here's what I believe. Um, I will not be part of any program, policy, um, act that hastens the bankruptcy of a program that is already underwater, pun intended. <laughs> Uh, I will not be part uh, of an action to accelerate the bankruptcy uh, of our republic. Uh, I will not be part of an action that fundamentally undermines what I viewed at the time as very modest reforms uh, of the National Flood Insurance Program. Uh, I'm on the record as saying that uh, in this Congress, the House Financial Services Committee will take up legislation to ultimately transition us uh, to a private market. Uh, I do not believe that there is fundamental market failure. I think we should allow the market to work. Now, it's going to be a transition. Uh, that bill is not going to be written today. I am attempting to work with my colleagues uh, to see if there is a way that we can address their concerns. Uh, and many of these concerns are, are legitimate, but ultimately, um, hardworking American taxpayers should not be forced to subsidize other people's flood insurance program, uh, flood insurance premiums. Uh, this is particularly true for those who have vacation homes, and if you have a vacation home, you ought to be able to afford the flood insurance, and if you can't, maybe you can't afford the vacation home. Um, and our repetitive loss properties, why the guy who works at the Pepsi bottling plant um, in Mesquite, Texas, in my district, has to be subsidizing um, some rich trial attorney's Florida beach condo is beyond me. Uh, it is patently unfair patently unfair. So what have I learned about PATH that's going to make it easier uh, to deal with flood? Beats the heck out of me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll add a quick comment. Uh, you know, the, the Bigger Waters flood insurance bill was only able to be passed with those reforms because the act itself was up for reauthorization. So the lesson should be here, whatever piece of legislation you're ever writing, include a sunset. That's your only opportunity to make it make it go away at some point. And I'll echo, ultimately, the solution B, I've got a lot of sympathy for people who are forced to be in flood insurance and pay higher rates. Uh, the solution is not to continue to give them subsidized flood insurance. The, continue, the solution is to let them get out and buy flood insurance in the private market for a cheaper rate or go without and bear that risk themselves. We could take one more question, maybe the lady in the red in the back. Um, I'm going to risk sounding her her heretical here at... Um here at the Heritage Foundation, I am a fan of Mr. Watts because of his advocacy on the judiciary for the 2D arts. He's one of the first people to have given a shout out for arts and photographers. 
point bringing it round a door opener might be the increasing number of crowdfunding for homes, hives that are growing, and that might be a conversation to start in on how people are now merging. There's just a suggestion from left field. You know, I, the, the, this might, it might amuse you. I've, I've quipped it several times, and again, this is the libertarian in me, so uh, my apologies to my conservative friends. But I, I often wonder what a better world it would have been if Barney Frank had showed judiciary instead of financial <laughs> services. Um, <laughs> that said, um, you know, I think the crowdfunding aspect is incredibly in, important, and, you know, I think the SEC has dragged its feet on implementing the JOBS Act. Uh, I do think we've got an opportunity here uh, to really, you know, grow investment from the bottom up. So, you know, that's something I think that's a direction we, we need to go. And I'll also say I'm not as, um, you know, there's a silver lining with Mr. Watt. You know, I think some of the concern uh, is that he goes back to either uh, funding the trust fund or, or, or forcing affordable housing goals. You know, I look at it this way. Um, we've seen so much of this talk about the profitability of Fannie and Freddie delay the debate. You know, I recognize I'm partly in the minority because most of their earnings have been one-off events, in my opinion. If he takes actions that make them less profitable when they start to lose money, that means we'll actually have a better chance at reform. <laughs> Thank you. Thank the, the eternal optimist. <laughs> in, in D.C., we have an area called Brookland, which is actually housing for the arts. So there is a way to open the door with Mr. Watts in a less combative, more sure. hello, how are you, and then take the conversation broader. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you for that. And Chairman, thank you for being here. We put on this event today because we wanted to highlight big, bold leaders with big, bold ideas. And I can't think of anybody in the House right now, um, certainly anybody with a, a committee assignment like you have, um, doing more to advance bold ideas, and so we're grateful for you being here, and uh, and thank you all for uh, for listening. Sure. I'm told we're going to take a 10-minute break. Um, we got to be back here in 10 minutes. The country's not going to save itself, and so we're going to press on. Uh, but we will let you go to the bathroom. <laughs>